Hello, my name is Alan, and welcome to my video series on how to build a Windows desktop application using Python. This is part two of my series, so enjoy. If you haven't already watched the first video in this series, then please review the following prerequisites before you begin. So if you look in the description below, you'll find a zip file that you can download. If you unzip that and open it inside, you'll find a test2 folder. This contains the source code from our previous example. If you open the main.ui file, you'll see our previous example, we used two buttons. We're going to start with a clean slate for this example so we can delete those two buttons. For this exercise, we'd like to create an, an application that requests the user enter their name. To do that, if we look on the left side, down at the bottom, there's a section called input widgets. One of the input widgets is a line edit widget. If we drag that into our interface, this is where the user can enter their name. But we need to let the user know what they need to do, so we're going to give it a label. And that's under the display widget section. There's labels. We'll name that name. When the user enters this name, we want to actually have a button over here so that we can execute something about that name. And under the button section, there's a push button. We're going to drag that in. And we're going to label this button split. Because what we're going to do is we're going to split their name. If they enter their first and last name, we're going to split it up. And then we're going to display it back to them. We can go over here to grab the widgets. But you can also grab the widgets that are within the window currently and copy them. If you hold the control key on the keyboard and select one of the, one of the widgets that you want to copy, and then drag it, it'll make a copy of it. And we're gonna say our first name, and then our last name. And we're gonna have one more button down here to close this particular window. Now the first thing you'll notice is that this layout is kind of haphazard. It's sort of what I call a mock-up layout. We're not focusing on making our layout dynamic. So you notice the size of these fields don't change. Our, our buttons don't stick to the right side or the left side, kind of like Designer does. If you drag it here, you'll see that the components on the right side are stuck to the right side and, and they stay there and they also size accordingly as I move it up and down. This kind of dynamic window is, is what we ultimately uh, want to achieve, but initially it's better to just focus on a static mockup. So if you want to, you can make this look nice. You can sort of align these a little better. We're gonna worry about a dynamic layout in the following video. In this video, we're just gonna focus on building this particular application. To reference these components in code, we need to label their uh, object names. So if you pick the object, it's right now its default name is line edit. That's not very useful. And I have a convention where uh, I'll use a prefix of three characters that identifies the type of widget. Since this is a line edit, I'll use EDT. And then I'll follow that with a descriptive, in this case, name. And so we'll name the other ones the same way. Edit first and edit last. And I'll do the same for buttons. And since they're buttons, I'll say BTN split. And this one will be BTN close. So now we have something we can uh, recognize in our code and go, oh yeah, that's the close button and this is the split button. So we save that and we're going to open up our source code in our source code editor. In our previous example, we deleted those two buttons. This is the code for those two buttons. I want to point out that the technique we use to call, uh, to create a, a callable function was what's called an automatic method or an automatic function. And 
the downside to this technique is that it's called an implicit call because you have to actually name it correctly with the on underscore, then the name of the button, and then the name of the signal, and in this case, clicked. There's a couple of downsides to this technique. One is that we have to use this decorator called uh, at PyQt slot. This is a decorator and it prevents being called twice. So I don't know if this is a bug in PyQt 5 and maybe they'll have it fixed in PyQt 6. Another downside is that these on methods are probably only available maybe 5% of the time. Most widgets don't have an on function for every possible signal. So what are we going to do for all of those, you know, 95% of the other scenarios where we want to have a function get called is there's a method called uh, connect. And since I can't remember the syntax for that, I'll search my own source code for connect. And we'll find one here. There we go. Copy that. Usually you'll do all your connect methods in your init section for your window class. So we'll paste that here. You reference all your widgets with self and then the widget name. And in our case, we have our first button, it's called button split. And it says the signal here is clicked. That's what we want. And the function it will call, we'll call it self dot uh, split name. So we'll rename this one to split name. As I was saying before, these decorators only needed for automatic functions. So we can delete this decorator. And we'll change this to a print statement for now. Split name here. And we'll delete this other button method we don't need. So now if we run this, let's see if this function works. And if we hit the split button, sure enough, we see split name here, printed out. So we know our connect method is working. And like I said, the benefit here is we don't have to have that decorator. We're now being very clear on how this is getting called with an explicit call. And this technique for this connect method exists for almost every combination of widget and signal that could exist, whereas the on automatic on method is kind of rare in most cases, it doesn't exist in mo for most widgets. So we want to go back to our code, go back to our user interface. We want to have it so that we can grab the value that's entered from this name and then the user hits the split button so we need to somehow, we need to know a method which can give us the text value. And when we, if we double click and we put a value in here, I'll just put my name. This is a default value. And if I don't change it when this program starts, it'll display the default value of Alan. It also helps me find it where it's referenced in code here. The attribute name is called text. So What that means is if we go into here, we can get that value We say self dot in the name of our widget, which in this case is edit name and then text. Since it's a, a function call, we need to have the parens. Now this will return the value. So we need to assign it to something. So we'll just call it name equals, and then we'll print that value out. Let's see if that works. Notice it didn't default the name, and that's because I didn't actually save it. Now if we run it, there's our default. But now if I hit split, see, name equals Alan. What if we want to know what other functions are available? Because sometimes we got a little bit lucky that the name of the method matched the name of the property, in this case, text. It, it Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. If you really want to know what are the different 
functions that we could call or methods that we can call for this particular type of widget, we need to know what kind of class this widget is. And where we can see that is if we look over here, after make sure we select it and look under the property editor, you can see it'll say it's a Qline edit. So if we go to Google and we type Qline edit, usually the very first thing that pops up is going to be the documentation that we want. And we're going to change this to Qt5 because it's going to default to the latest, which is Qt6. And if we scroll down a little bit, we'll see there's a section called public functions. And these are all the functions that can apply to a Qline edit field. And you can see right here is our text. Our goal, not only do we want to grab the name, but we want to split the name. And in Python, that's using the split function. So we'll say name.split. And the default is based on spaces, so I don't need to give it a separator character. We want to assign that to result. So the first name would be equal to result, the first item in the list, which is since it's zero base, we'll start with zero. And last name is result one. Let's print those out. And run that. Type in Alan Lily. Hit the split button. And there we go. First is Alan, last is Lily. So that actually worked. But we don't want to display it here in the print statements. We want to display it in the user interface so the user can see it. To do that, we need to remember our object names for uh, the first name and for the last name, or edit first and edit last. And we need a different method this time. We can't use text. Text is a method that returns returns the line edit text. We need to find what is the method that will allow us to assign the value to the line edit. So we know it's going to be self.edit first and then some method. So we got to go back to our documentation again. I'll save you the time of looking through the, the, the public functions here. It's not actually in the public functions because it's under one of the subclasses. So you got to click on list all members. And I just happen to know in this really long list, it is called set text. So if we go back to our code, set text. And this time we actually pass it the string and the string we want to assign it is the value that we split out, which is called first. If we run that and type in two names, hit split. The first name was split out and we didn't actually assign it to the last field. So let's do that. And the widget is called edit last. Split, and there it splits it out correctly for us. Let's change our default back again. Save that. So now what if the user doesn't do as we expect? And let's say they don't put anything in and they hit the split button. Our program crashes, and why is that? Well, because we're telling it to split on name, and name is blank. And that probably doesn't crash. So if we print out that result, it'll probably be fine. What's where it's probably crashing is when we try to index a list that has no values. So it's probably crashing on this line right here. So if we run that, we can verify, hit split. And sure enough, result comes out, but this doesn't come out. So it's crashing on this line of code. So we need to add some way to prevent it from happening. And this is very common in programs where you need to put some edits. And the edit in this case is if the result, actually the length of the result, is not equal to two, we're going to want, want to give an error. In this case, must enter two names. 
and then we're going to return because we don't want it to continue on because we know it will crash if it tries to do this and by returning it just exits this function so we run that now if we don't enter anything we hit the split button it gives us the error message but ultimately we don't really want to print out the error message we would rather have the user see the message inside either the status bar or a nice message dialog and that message dialog technique is called Q message box and I don't remember all the syntax but again I like to reference my own code so I'll find a Q message box and here's one we'll copy it and we'll put it in here this is a Q message box that's an informational message box I should say self this is, I remember now, as the title of the dialogue that will pop up, and this is the error message that's in the dialogue. Take that from here. So now if we click it, it crashes. Okay, now it's crashing because we probably did not import the message box, and I happen to know that Q message box is under the QT widgets. So we need to make sure we import it. And if it's not imported, when it got here, it crashed. So now if we run it, now we get a message saying must enter two names. The last thing we have to do is we want to have the close button do actually do something. So we go back up here. We need to have another connector for our close button. And I just so happen to know that if you want to close your application, the command to close it is simply close. So now if we run that and we click the close button, our application closes. Another nice thing to know is, is, is there's another automatic function called close event. And its parameters are self and an event that gets passed in. If we put a print statement in there, and now if we run it and we click the close button, we can see that it did automatically call the close event. That's useful because maybe there's something you want to do, like close some files or, or some other actions that you need to do if the user should close the application. And it's also nice because they don't have to just click your close button to close the application. If they click the X button, it also calls the close event. Anyway, this is a good point to leave off for now. And in the next tutorial, we'll cover how to make this GUI dynamic. It took me a long time to learn how to, to do dynamic layouts and how to use these different layout features to do a dynamic layout and make it work the way we want it to. It can be quite tricky. So we'll see you then.